Hi folks, it's me, Ali Nesen. I'm joined today by Dr. Shafiq Safi, our Rebuild in the fa Faculty. Shafiq, thanks so much for joining. It's my pleasure. So we're at the AAE meeting. This is the third case that Shafiq has done and is sharing with us, and I wanted to kind of bring this case to you as well to see how this uh, young faculty here are uh, doing great and exciting cases and are you know using their knowledge and sharing it with you guys um, around the world. And, uh, and uh, Shafiq, this case is a non-surgical case exactly. of a maxillary second molar. molar. So uh, a lot of fun, and I can see the preoperative radiograph, and uh, you know better you than me doing this case. I don't want to have to deal with these kind of cases. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So this is a this is a non-surgical case that has a very interesting uh, root canal anatomy that I wanted to, to share with you. So uh, this case is a 30-year-old patient that showed up to my showed up to my office with a chief complaint that he cannot chew on his uh, tooth. His uh, medical history was uh, non-contributory, no known drug allergies. This is also always something important to check with your patients, see if there's any uh, medical history that could contribute to you to you not being able to maybe uh, or any in contraindications to root canal treatment or any of the materials that you use, especially in terms of latex allergy and penicillin allergies and stuff like that. Upon my uh, clinical and uh, radiological examination, the tooth was testing negative to cold. The patient was very sensitive to percussion. There was no signs of any probing or mobility, and it's very important always to check uh, the probing in these cases. That uh, it could be some indication that maybe there's a crack or uh, something worthy of further investigation in that tooth. Uh, also, in the X-ray, you know, it lo looks like a very large uh, 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 root canal uh, shapes, and there's small widening on the palatal uh, side of the uh, of the root of the palatal root. And uh, so the clinical diagnosis of this case was a uh, pulpal necrosis with a symptomatic apical uh, periodontitis. The treatment was non-surgical root canal treatment in order to conserve the tooth, which is really the, uh, the main point uh, in doing uh, when, when the patient consulted me. The prognosis, of course, was favorable since there was nothing that would really limit our chances of reaching the high success rate that root canal treatment today uh, offers for our patient. My protocol in that case was uh, very simple at the beginning after uh, local anesthesia, rubber dam placement, uh, straight line access. I find my uh, working lens in uh, all the uh, canals and we'll talk about the canals which is the main point of this presentation. I did some uh, hand finding up to a size of 1502 and then I used the expediter which is a 1505 file in all my canals and after that I used the XP shaper. Uh, to be able to clean the canals in a very uh, uh, minimally invasive yet anatomical way to be able to really clean all these uh, irregularities and lateral canals and fins and extensions that we all know exist in root canal. Uh, we see in all these micro CTs and even in all the uh, primary studies that were done in the 1920s by all these people like Hess and, and, and all these people, we see that root canals are not round, they're anything but round. And this new uh, sh uh, file is really a promising tool to be able to really achieve microbial control in a much uh, predictable fashion. After I did my cleaning and shaping and the four canals that I found, I took my, uh, my CornFit X-ray and to my greatest uh, surprise, I see that what looked to me as an MB2, which we usually really want to uh, find in those upper molars, we always hear about oh, MB2, MB2, MB2. The, uh, there was actually a second palatal canal that was connecting to the first palatal canal, and I was very, very, very surprised. And it's something that we rarely see, maybe, and uh, we'll talk about the prevalence of these cases. And so, uh, what I did in that case, and especially since it's a necrotic tooth, I decided to place calcium hydroxide in there and I told myself let's take a CBCT to be able to study more the internal anatomy of this tooth and maybe there's another canal or something else that I'm missing. And so that's what I did. I took the CBCT and these are some of the uh, slices that uh, I present. We can clearly see on the uh, actual side, on the actual slice, that the palatal root had a, was a C-shaped uh, and that uh, there was kind of a two portal of entrance, which really uh, was a, like a C3 or a C3A classification, depending on what uh, literature or what article you are using. And also, I was able to confirm that really this PDL widening on the palatal uh, root was really a real lesion, as we could see on the uh, on the CBCT. And uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, Dr. Nasir, a lot of articles out there saying saying that. To be able to detect a periapical radiolucency on a CBCT is much more predictable than a traditional periapical radiolucency. Just to name some, for example, uh, like uh, Estrella and, and, and all these big uh, names. 
and a lot of recent articles by Pope and, and uh, Abella talking about the presence of like widening of PDLs that translate into real periapical lucency on CBCTs. And you know, uh, Shavik here on this radiograph, it looks like there might be some sinus uh, inflammation as well, or some kind of a thickening of the sinus membrane That's that true. might be a consequence of this chronic okay. uh, necrotic tooth. Exactly. Um, in this area, perhaps pouring into the sinus. But let me also compliment you on the use of the CBCT here because, you know, by breaking it down, some people advocate the use of a CBCT on every maxillary molar. In my opinion, that is a little bit of an overtreatment. You look at a preoperative radiograph, if there's a question, you can take a radiograph. Also, in questions, when you go inside the tooth and then you find some aberrant anatomy, and then you, it would be a good idea to then take a, ready, uh, to take a CBCT. Taking it on every single tooth, As if some people are out there, yeah. they do it. I guess that's a point of we contention. We have to stick to the uh, Alara principle, which is uh, as low as reasonably achievable in terms of even taking like uh, uh, conventional uh, two-dimensional periapical radiographs and of course CBCTs. The indications of a CBCT by uh, the latest position statement of the AAE and the American Association of uh, Oral and Maxillofacial Radiologists really says that you really have to take them under like certain condi uh, when certain indications are there for surgery, planning, diagnosis, yeah, or treatment. Yeah, surgery and retreatment, oh, I course. think. Every yeah, case, it's a good it's idea a good to do idea. it. But then in, in these cases, really, when you detect yeah. that there's something worthy of investigation, such in my case, Definitely. that palatal number two that appeared, I was like, it's something that really don't encounter very frequently, and that's yeah. also worthy for you to document in your uh, in the patient's chart that, you know, there was a P2, we found it, we treated it, and this is how it came up. Yeah, so if you're doing a normal, you know, anterior premolar is the tooth yeah, that you yeah. don't have any question on, yeah. it's just not necessary to take a CT. And even if it's a second, uh, it's a second molar, yeah. you found like an MB1, MB2, B2, the stobacco palatal. Yeah. The chamber looks fairly uh, conventional in shape and form. There's nothing that really make you suspicious. There's something that you need to, to investigate. I don't think why you should really expose your and, patient and to additional radiation. Uh, absolutely. And here it was obviously very fruitful. You can yeah, see here from the axial section that the C-shaped uh, palatal root is present. There is no MB2. There's I no th MB2. Thank it's God there is no MB2, but guess what? You have a C-shaped palatal yeah, root. Exactly. <laughs> you, know, you can't yeah, the win. Patient, I, mean, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> much I, rather have an MB2, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> I'd much, much rather deal with MB2 than C-shaped palatal root That's true. with two portal of, of entrance. And then I tried to find maybe there's another one, but yeah. I mean, you have to really be careful because these areas could be very uh, narrow and then you could easily perforate Absolutely. or cause uh, further damage. Absolutely. So at this point, it was really like two palatal canals in the same root. And yeah. a C-shaped root, which was really the... Uh, you know, you can see the MB2 in the first molar, but <laughs> not in the second molar. And you know, these C-shaped palatal roots in the maxilla are not common enough, uh, at all. But we yeah. were talking about that, you know, having, myself having practiced now for 25 years, I have seen a few of these. And in fact, you see a lot of these maxillary palatal roots that are fused with the distal buccal root. That's true. And those cause a lot of failures down the line or problems if they're not adequately cleaned out because those create these oval canals that are not adequately shaped, shaped and cleaned and formed, yes. using our conventional instruments. I'm sorry, go ahead. So, uh, so the after I confirmed the, the presence of these canals and this wonderful anatomy by CBCT, the patient came back for a second visit upon which, of course, I re-entered the root canal, of course, under aseptic conditions, rubber dam, and uh, very important. I did my uh, irrigation protocol. I rechecked if there's anything that uh, needs to be rechecked. Of course, with the CBCT, it's very uh, rare that you could go wrong. And I uh, upgraded the four canals using the uh, bioceramic sealer and the bioceramic gara percha with the XP3D shaper. Of course, we are able to shape our canals or to reach, let's say, I would say a dimension, uh, an apical size of a 30 or 4 fairly easily, especially in that case uh, being a, 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 a 30 or 4, I was able also to take the palatal to a 35 or 4 with that, uh, with that uh, shaper. And I filled it with the bioceramic sealer and bioceramic gara percha, which really is a very, fairly uh, uh, biological way of treating uh, root canals, uh, really closing the link between instrumentation, operation, in a very streamlined fashion, I would say, to be able really to uh, make it very easy and at the same time very predictable on the yeah. long term. And we see on the shift shot x-ray really that uh, second palatal that is joining the first palatal and uh, one can only really uh, yeah. hope that these cases will uh, get to come back for the follow-ups and see really the healing and uh, the longevity of these cases as, uh, as the patient is still Well, you've done a great job. It's very nicely cleaned out and, uh, and, and obturated, so it's definitely going to do well. And here's the problem in cases where this uh, additional root or the C-shaped anatomy is not recognized. 
you could leave a you know a little plug of bacteria in there, exactly. which may not fail immediately, but down the line it becomes an issue. So having the proper magnification elimination, Definitely. the correct use of the CBCT in a case like this to get additional information and and then obviously having the knowledge that these things exist uh, are very important. Have your Apex locator handy because if you see a little canal like that, make sure you put it on yeah. your file to make sure it's, <laughs> make not, sure it's not a perforation. Exactly. This was my first, I mean, because the, 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 the location of the orifice yeah. was very, very, like, it was very unfamiliar to me. I, mean, I didn't, I yeah. wasn't in practice for a long time, but you know, the MB2 is somewhere between MB1 and yeah. the belt, and then you saw this, and this, it was yeah. actually, some vital tissue in there, which the case was, of course, partially vital, partially necrotic. We see a lot right. of these cases in molar. And I took my file and put it in and hooked my apex locator. I'm like, well, you know, it's not, it's not beeping right away. Maybe it's a real canal, and this is why I continued to slowly, Explore slowly it dig. In there. And I saw like what looked like palpable tissue in there, and then I found the the, uh, the working length and the X-ray really confirmed it. Yeah. And further on CBCT, and really these variations in second molars, other than non-MB2, are are very uh, interesting, I find, and it's very important to keep it in mind. We hear a lot about MB2 and how to find them, how to negotiate them, but really the uh, C-shaped canal in, 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 in an upper uh, second molar and also uh, two palatal canals and a palatal uh, root and an upper molar are very important to remember. Uh, not very recent uh, studies, but studies show that, for example, uh, there was like up one to 1.4% 1 prevalence of having two palatal canals and upper molars, a lot of case reports out there about C-shaped palatal canals. So it's important to keep this in mind and always uh, study the internal anatomy of the chamber. And of course, a CBCT today is a very good tool to be able to diagnose these observations and to really know how to deal with them and treat them and hopefully be more and more familiar with them. So that's wonderful, wonderful management, great diagnosis and ma uh, management of the case and execution of the entire clinic shaping and the obturation. So great job. The key also is to just have the expectation that there's always four canals in every molar until proven otherwise. Exactly. And that is probably a good expectation to go with. This way you're going to have an eye for the fourth canal, whether it's a MB2, whether it's a P2 second paddle P2. maybe something that you see sometimes. Something else. Second yeah. distal This the is where uh, the lower, yeah. magnification and illumination are really, yeah. really, really handy. Terrific. And proper access as well so that you're not missing anatomy Absolutely. that could really be hidden underneath all this. Well, Shafiq, thanks for all your work and everything you do and sharing your knowledge with our audience here. Uh, if you haven't caught the first two parts of this video, go ahead and watch the other two cases that we discussed earlier on. So I'm here with Dr. Shafiq Safi at DAE 2017 and uh, moving on to do some uh, more visit of the exhibits of and course, so some yeah. of the other courses. Of course, of Shafiq, course. thank you so much That's for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for being with I'm Ali Nese. And I'm Shafiq Safi. And we hope you found this information helpful. Thank and let's much. save some tea. Of course, always. <laughs>